Well, uh, we're delighted to welcome Gabor Mate back to our show. Welcome, Gabor. Nice to be back, you guys. Great to see you. Uh, we thought that um, we would talk with you today a little bit more about your own um, personal journey as a human being. And, uh, you know, you've dedicated most of your life uh, in your professional world anyway to trauma and uh, elucidating the underlying um, causes of things you know, from autoimmune disease to uh, other physical illnesses to manifestations of trauma and psychology. Um, how, how, how would you connect your earliest experiences to your lifelong interest in trauma? Well, the first thing I have to say is that it's not quite accurate to say that I've dedicated my life to trauma. Um, it's more like I just want to figure out why things are the way they are. And uh, it's not like I, I said, well, let's look at trauma. I, as a physician, as a family practitioner, but also in my personal life, I just want to know why are things the way they are. So, um, and, and so if, if trauma then arises as a significant part of the answer, that's in the nature of the inquiry. But it's not, it's not that it's a decision that I made. And that's an important distinction. Because I think in, 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 in life in general, um, and, and in medicine specifically, I think the big question is just why are things the way they are? And, and without that, we can't get to any sort of answers as to what to do about things. So that's a long way of answering your question. But in my own life, with my particular history of... of um, being an Eastern European Jew uh, who, who was born into the Second World War and its traumas, and then my family having been devastated by the genocide. Uh, and then growing up in communist Hungary um, as, as, a, as, a, as a child. And I have to say that the communist system brutal and dictatorial as it was, on the ideological level, taught social caring and social justice as its ideals. So you had a system that inculcated a certain sense of social justice at the same time as trampling all over it in real practice. So the question why are things the way they are and why do people do these terrible things to these, each other and why do people have to suffer who don't deserve to suffer these questions have, have been agitating me ever since i was a child and of course that naturally extends into to the practice of medicine as well why do people suffer and, and what are the sources of suffering and um, <laughs> then i've had to deal with my own um, challenges you know my I, i'm a depressive basically my baseline is my, my default baseline is depression you know so that's that's where i automatically go if there's a default network in the brain mine is organized around sort of a negative view of life and 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 a kind of um it'll never get better um not ideology but mindset now, I happen to know that that's not accurate. I'm just talking about the default setting. So I had to ask, well, what set me that way? And why do I keep going back to it? Despite what I know. So all this, so then the answer that emerges to all these questions happens to be trauma. So that's, that's how I got to, to my trauma perspective. Did that, um, you know, you, you obviously were born into a very extremely challenging climate at the time. And, um, and, and I hear you, you're basically asking these questions of like, why, why do we suffer this way? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, were you also sort of asking the questions, why do people treat each other this way? Why do, you know, is that a question you've been asking yourself in your lifetime? 
Yeah, so why do people do to each other what they do? Why, yeah. Why do people impose suffering on one another, uh, on themselves, and, and, and then on one another? Yeah. And, and again, yeah. and again, the answer I come to is trauma. Mm -hmm. So is, so is that, you know, with the way the world is right now, there's kind of a heightened moment, a uh, lot of tension, a lot of social unrest. And so is, is, are you, is your kind of understanding that people are acting out of trauma basically when they're just, you know, uh, treating people poorly and that it's really all stems from trauma? Is that kind of your conclusion? Well, yeah, that's a really important question, Keith, and 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 this is where I need to be careful, because there's a kind of a danger, a reductionism in um, narrowing everything down to individual psychology. But it's not that simple. There's also a system in place here, so that um, just to look at COVID, what do we see? We see, first of all, that it doesn't bestow its curses equally on the population. That certain people are more vulnerable. Now, it's not that anybody is um, immune to the possibility of getting COVID, but it's not striking the population equally, is it? It has really striking people who are politically the least powerful, economically the most exploited, and racially the most oppressed. So that's not just a question of individual trauma, that's a question of how our whole system is set up. And economically speaking, again, it's devastating the most vulnerable. And the richest are actually getting richer, so that the, the, the most uh, wealthy people have actually reaped major benefits under the COVID system. So Jeff Bezos is multiple billions of dollars richer in now than he was in March. And he's not the only one. So that, so that in addition to individual trauma, we also have to look at the system in which the trauma operates. So if you take, um, if you take some, if you take something like Donald Trump, who, 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 I've always, I've been saying for years publicly that he's a highly traumatized man. You can just tell his trauma. All you have to do is look at him for five seconds, turn the sound off and just look at his face. You see a traumatized person. But because of his class background and the fact that he comes from a wealthy family, his particular trauma results in him being elected to the most powerful office in the country, in, in, in your country. Somebody else with his level of trauma from a lower class background ends up in jail. So that th there's also a, a, a system in place here. And, and so that the individual trauma, and you know, this is the subject of my next book, but the individual trauma manifests itself in a social, economic, political context. And so it's not just the individual psychology that explains why things are the way they are but also how a system is set up, who rules and who benefits and who suffers and who makes decisions and who doesn't. Uh, these also have huge uh, implications uh, on, on why, why and who suffers. Right, we have these intergenerational structures that have evolved for the concentration of power, um, power over and you know, it's been uh, thousands of years that this has been growing and building. And uh, we recently interviewed Resma Menachem, who talks about structural racism. He's a African American uh, somatic experiencing practitioner in Minneapolis, and uh, he was talking about how um, people with white bodies were um, beheading each other and traumatizing each other and um, killing and, you know, maiming and subordinating each other in Europe for hundreds of years uh, before white people started dominating um, African descent people in this continent. And um, his work has me, um, and I think about your work and his work, and it, it reminds me of the not just the personal journey of healing trauma, but also what, what can we do on 
this more structural level. And uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, yeah. So, um, I, again, this is something I'm thinking about. And uh, the, the last time there was really quality on Earth was when we were, when we were living in small band hunter-gatherer groups of 50, 80 to 100 people before the accumulation of private property and power and, uh, and gender control. And that was about, now that's most of human existence, by the way. This is how we evolved. So that I think humanoids or homonyms have been on earth for half a million years or so, I think. And our particular species, Homo sapiens, has been around for 150,000 years, give or take. And for 90% of that time, we lived in small band hunter-gatherer groups. Entirely different ethic, uh, communal sense, uh, sense of oneself, relationship to nature, relationship to each other, relationship to childhood, relationship to child rearing, relationship to authority. All that was completely different. And then with the agriculture, this is generally acknowledged now, then with the agricultural revolution, you get the accumulation of private property. And with the accumulation of private property, now you have variations of, of, of wealth and power. Then you have the rise of the patriarchy. And so ever since the onset of what we might call class society, where people are starting to divide into classes, some with more, some with less, some with absolute and some with absolutely no control whatsoever, then you have the, the phenomena that you describe. And um, th then, uh, but racism as such really becomes prevalent with the rise of capitalism. When, um, and there was slavery before, but slavery wasn't based on race. In a Roman empire, you could be a white person and become a slave. Mm. For what that's worth. So when 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 in when in Europe, Western Europe, capitalism arises and then the search for raw materials and and, and uh, expansion begins um, with the Spanish and Dutch and British empires, French empires, then all of a sudden and especially so then we start dominating, we, I mean, the, the Caucasians start dominating other races and especially consigning them to slavery. Now you have to have an ideology that explains to you why we have the right to do this. And the ideology is both religious and that we have the right religion so we can slaughter them in the name of Jesus. And literally, if you read the histories of Latin America, um, you can't kill people if they don't know about Jesus. But if you tell them about Jesus and they don't succumb, then you then they're pagans and you now you can kill them. So literally, the Spanish would arrive in some coastal village, read out in Latin or Spanish some Christian doctrine, and if the natives didn't agree, now you could slaughter them. Literally, this is how they saw it. So there was this religious um, superiority. And then the racial one, that, that, that we have, because they're inferior, we have the right to control them, dominate them, kill them, or enslave them. So that, so that the very concept of race was, was a fairly recent um, development. Uh, in tandem with the rise of capitalism and its need to uh, dominate other uh, nations internationally and other other peoples. And by the way, if you look at the history of American policing, you know how police how policing are, arose. I mean, when we talk about um, the racial bias in, in police practice, policing in the states started off as slave patrols to capture control escape slave that was its origin so th these things that we take for granted 
they all have a historical origin, which relate to the nature of the system. And so it's structural, as, as your friend yeah. said. Yeah, structural. Yeah. And obviously, from your experience in Hungary, um, this kind of gaslighting or disingenuous uh, concern about um, social equity, uh, which in practice was not happening from what I'm understanding. Yeah. Um, and having experienced the Canadian political environment after that, I mean, do you observing, you know, the American nightmare over here, um, is there, do you, what do you think about, um, how humans organize and, and, and structure themselves in a culture. I mean, is, is, is there a possibility that's not just a utopian fantasy for um, all of us to have opportunity and care for each other? Well, it's interesting, you know, so uh, I grew up as a fervent little communist, you know, so that in school assemblies, when the principal would mention the party and the leader. It was like a cue. And we would all stand up and would clap. Long live Rakushi. Rakushi was the name of the Hungarian mini Stalin that ruled the country. And long live the party. And I was totally enthusiastic about it. And um, I remember in um, 55, when I was 11 years old, there was a block meeting organized by the party. And uh, I was given this poem to recite, and I, I did recite it with my fist raised in the end, fist raised in the air, saying, uh, chanting, or tremble, you lords of Wall Street. Now, I had no idea what Wall Street was or where it was, you know. But I mean, I was. You know. So then comes the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, where the country rose against the communist system the dictatorial, dictatorial nature of it, the inequality, the, 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 the brutality of it. And against the Soviet occupation. And all of a sudden, I realized that what I believed in was a total illusion. That I'd bought into some kind of, some kind of a dream. You know, and I was 13. And so, the Soviets, who had saved my life as an infant in defeating the Germans, now, and, and, and whom I had idolized all my life as a child, now become the enemy and the oppressor. So we come to the West, and the Americans become the heroes. And I remember traveling to Germany, seeing these cocky, clothed American servicemen, and seeing them as the protectors and the heroes. That was 1950, early 1957. And, and then Wall Street becomes a symbol of prosperity. And American capitalism becomes the symbol of democracy and, and freedom and, 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 and protection. That's 57. And then, by the early 60s, five, six, seven years later, comes the Vietnam War. And I saw, the, I see these American heroes of democracy slaughtering millions of Asians in the name of a complete lie. And then uh, the, and then history, I started looking at history. And I started looking at how virtually Every single one of American wars, uh, when we're, there were wars of expansion and aggression, starting with the Mexican-American War, and then uh, the annexation of you know Texas, and then the Spanish-American War, and the war in the Philippines, and the extermination of local resistance, the multiple interventions in Latin America ever since, in the name of freedom, in support of brutal dictatorships like Somoza in Nicaragua and uh, Batista in, 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 uh, in Cuba. And this continues. 
I, I, if, I'm going to give you guys a fact. And this, this is easy. You can easily look this up. You don't have to take my word for it. But if I asked you, you guys, progressive, open-minded people, aware Americans, how many people were slaughtered in Guatemala in the 1990s? Not that long ago. With American support. Could you tell me a figure? I'm asking. Couldn't. No, I couldn't. Okay. hundred thousand. No, I couldn't tell you. A hundred thousand. And you don't even know about it. No, you don't have to take my word for it. You can really look this up and research it. And, and if I'm wrong, let me know. But I know I'm not wrong. Between 80 to 100,000, mostly indigenous peasants. I could go on and on and on and on. And so what I came to realize is that the um, everything that the Soviets had said about the Americans was true. Not Americans as a people, but the American system as racist, as imperialist, and so on. And everything that the Americans said about the Soviets was also true. Brutal dictatorship, exploitative, um, dishonest. Everything they said about each other was true. And everything they said about themselves was a lie. That's what I found out. So then the question becomes, <laughs> is there some way out? Well, I happen to think there is. Uh, not that I'm here to prescribe it, but but the very fact that we're talking about this, uh, the, 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 the people are always interested in the truth, and, and, and there's an innate desire in people for freedom, whether they know it or not. There's an innate desire for freedom and for truth. So I believe in that. And I, I, and I also don't believe that any system is, it's foolish to think that any system is permanent. I mean, if you look at history, Systems change and, and empires fall and, and, and new things arise. I mean, you might say, well, what it was is equally as bad and some is worse than one before. And that's often true. But the point is that nothing is permanent. But what I think what is permanent is the human um, desire for truth and justice and freedom. I think that's permanent. It doesn't always manifest itself. And it's often beaten down but it's never destroyed. So I believe in that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, you're reminding me, I had a, a conversation in Israel, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago with a rabbi. And I said, I asked him the question of, um, you know, is this, is life on earth right now? Is this as good as it's going to get? Like, is this sort of, yeah. As as is this going to be as sort of skillful as we get as uh, as nations interacting with each other? And he said to me, um, you know, "You're not really grasping that when you look at um, the span of how long nations have been around. That we're really just children still as nations. We're not e we're not even teenagers or adults yet at all. We haven't been around long enough to claim that." And um, he said, uh, hopefully we make it through adolescence <laughs> and don't kill each other along the way. Um, so, yeah, I'm just curious, like, are you, do you feel like, you know, hopeful that, you know, human beings are on a quest for truth that, um, what do you, what do you feel like needs to change here on a more global level in terms of how we're going to get along? Is it just personal work? More personal work has to happen for people to grow up and, and learn how to be together? Or is it something else? Well, history does have a logic of its own. So um, when systems begin to fail, I mean, one of the things that's happening now in the Western world is a lot of people are starting to question the system. You know, 10 years ago, if you use the word capitalism, you'd be seen as a raving lunatic Marxist. But now the New York Times has editorials about can capitalism be saved from itself? You know, in other words, when, when, when things come into crisis, people start questioning things. And so if you look at the French Revolution, you know, which was very much inspired by the American Revolution, by the way, um, when things begin to fail, then people start developing new ideologies and, and new ways of looking at the world. So 
the French slogan of uh, um, of uh, equality and and solidarity and freedom um, wouldn't have made sense in the 15th century, although it did make sense to some people, because there was peasant rebellions in Europe where the slogan was, you know. Uh, well, there was a, the, the peasant rebellion in, in, in England was it 15th century, and the slogan was when uh, when Adam wove and Eva span, who was then the gentleman. In other words, at the beginnings of humanity, where were the class distinctions? You know, so people have a sense that this isn't right. So as systems begin to fail, people start asking questions, and out of those questions will come the answers. So as the French feudal system began to totter and fail, and it didn't happen overnight, <clears throat> but all of a sudden, equality, liberty, fraternity become the slogans. Now, the revolution very quickly betrayed its own slogans, just as the Russian revolution very quickly betrayed its own slogans. But the very fact that these slogans arise and repeatedly speaks to what I mean about the human drive for freedom and for, and for, and for truth and for justice. So yeah, I think that's going to continue. I think that's eternal. And uh, I once spoke with Noam Chomsky. No, actually, Chomsky was interviewed. And he was asked, is he a pessimist or, uh, or an optimist? And he said, strategically, I'm an optimist, and tactically, I'm a pessimist. Which means that in the long term, yeah, I believe in positive change in the short term things might get worse before they get better. And that's how I see the situation right now. So yeah, I, I remain an optimist in the long term. But I think, well, this brings you back to medicine. Um, the Greek playwright Aeschylus and his play, The Agamemnon, he has the chorus say that the way the world, the way the gods created us, we have to suffer into truth. We have to suffer into truth. Now, I'm sure you've both seen this in your clinical practice, that something terrible happens to somebody, and then they start learning the truth, and they actually become transformed by their suffering in positive ways. I mean, maybe all three of us have experienced this in less dramatic ways, but I suffered, certainly had to suffer into a lot of truth in my own life. And the same thing is true of people on a social level. So sometimes we have to go through some very difficult times before we grasp the truth. I'm wondering I, I about no it. I, no, I no longer remember what question I just answered, but I hope it was a good well, answer. <laughs> it's a good, it was a great answer. I, uh, <laughs> inside of the, uh, the chaos and the unrest and the, and the, and the questioning of the patriarchal structure, um, it seems like to me that there must be opportunities to, for, um, you know, huge opportunities for change and transformation inside of the um, decline or the, you know, the opening up of this structure. And um, I'm wondering, you know, if you, if you have any ideas, Gabor, of what some of those opportunities are right now. Well, So, um, you had the horrible case of George Floyd. Now, that opened a lot of people's eyes to systemic and structural racism. So, for example, the support for Black Lives Matter amongst non-Black people went up quite a bit in the immediate aftermath. Now, it's an interesting question to ask is, well, where were these people before? Like police brutality against black people. Nothing new about it. It's only been going on for 400 years. And there's been numerous examples of it every year in the States. This happened to go on, 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 on this was, they happened to go viral. That's the only, only reason we know about it. Because there happened to be a 17 year old young woman there with the presence of mind and the courage to film it. But nevertheless, it happened. And all of a sudden, there was a huge opportunity to ask some questions that before then you couldn't have asked or have people listen. Uh, in K 
Canada is the same thing. You asked about Canada before. Well, you, you can't go up in Canada and have your eyes open and not recognize what a racist system you live in. Because um, when I worked in addictions in Vancouver's downtown east side, 30% of my clients were First Nations origin, Aboriginal origin. They make up 5% of the population. If you look at Canadian jails, 30% of the jail population are First Nations, Aboriginal origin. They make up 5% of the population. You have to believe one of two things. There's something inherently wrong with these people. In other words, you can take a racist attitude. Or the system is doing something to them. And of course, what it's doing is traumatizing them, which means they end up with more, more with their addictions, end up more um, dysfunctional, violent, and addiction related behaviors that land them in jail, which this system, what we do is we punish people of lower class who get traumatized. We reward people. <laughs> Very often, people of higher class who get traumatized, like a, a Harvey Weinstein, who clear, clearly to me is a highly traumatized person, you know, from what little I know of his history. But he, you can just see him. But he gets to be powerful and, and, and wreak all kinds of damage before he's brought down. And in another there, in another era, 10 years ago, he might not have been brought down. And, or, or, or as I mentioned earlier, Donald Trump. So, um, so the possibility when these crises happen is for people to see the truth. So I think we, what we can do right now is start really asking why, what's going on, and not be satisfied with superficial answers. But, but I mean, from the medical point of view, um, well, I was speaking to, do you know who Louis Mel Medrona is? He's a, an American uh, physician, psychiatrist. He's also of, uh, partly of uh, Cherokee and Lakota origin. So he's worked in high-tech emergency medicine, but he's also knowledgeable of native ways. He was telling me that in the Lakota tradition, when somebody gets sick, they're seen as the canary in the mine. In other words, they see it, they're seen as manifesting the illness or dysfunction of the whole system or the group that they're a part in. So they're actually honored for manifesting the dysfunction of the system. And so that everybody gathers around to help heal them because in doing so, they're healing the whole group. Now, it so happens, that's also the physiological scientific truth about illness in general, but most physicians are not aware of it. So that when uh, somebody develops um, an addiction in a family or mental illness in a family, or in my view, and I can show this, physiological illness in a family, then it's not just an individual thing. They're manifesting their relationships with the whole system that they're a part of. So Dan Siegel, the psychiatrist, talks about interpersonal neurobiology, about her our, 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 our nervous systems are locked into each other's or, and, and reflect each other. That faces other meanings as well, but that's one of them. So that how I speak to you and in what tone I speak to you and with what body language I speak to you and what our power relationships are has an impact on your physiology and your nervous system. Now I take, as, as, as a medical doctor, I take that a step further. And I take Dan's concept of interpersonal neurophysiology or neurobi inter interpersonal neurobiology, and I say, all our biology is interpersonal. Through the stress apparatus, through the hormone apparatus, through the nervous system, we, we affect each other, which means that the manifestation of illness in an individual is um, it actually speaks to the system that they're a part of. The multi, as you mentioned earlier, the multi-generational system and the current family system and the community and so on. And we can see this in COVID because again, who gets sick and who doesn't isn't totally accidental. It's a systemic manifestation. And so again, um, the healing has to begin with asking, well, what is it about the system that we're all a part of? 
that these illnesses are manifesting. And COVID, for one, is a lot of lessons to teach. And so maybe, I mean, the biggest tragedy, apart from the individual and community tragedies of people getting sick and dying, but the biggest long-term tragedy of COVID would be if we didn't learn the lessons. Because it's got a lot to teach us. So I think what we can do to start with is educate ourselves and keep asking questions. And by the way, you guys might ask yourselves as, as two Americans, how come you didn't know about Guatemala? And, 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 and not as a, you should have known and as, as a self-critical or, or as a accusatory question, but really as a question of inquiry. How can we live in, we have this free news media and this free internet and all kinds of information that's available. What kind of a bubble do we live in that we're not aware of what's happening next door as a result of our own policies? And all these people that are coming from Central America to the States, these refugees that Trump wants to build the wall against and which Obama deported in higher numbers than any president before him. Where are they coming from? There's a new book called uh, The Unforgetting by Roberto Lovato, who's an Ecuadorian American journalist. Just was reviewed in the New York Times on this last weekend. In his country, in Ecuador, tens of people were slaughtered by the army and by right wing death squads with American support and American weaponry and American leadership. Do Americans even know about it? Do they realize that these refugees that are coming from those countries are coming from dire situations created by American domination and foreign policy? So, um, or, and the same questions could be asked, you know, internally, how come such a high proportion of the prison population is, 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 is minority origin? Same as in my country. I'm not saying Canada is better than the States. I'm saying that these systemic questions need to be asked, and we have to break through the wall of denial and this bubble that we all live in, where we're not seeing the whole of reality. So I think that's the biggest question here, is are we willing to break through the bubble? Just as I lived in this bubble, as this idealistic little um, communist, you know. Um, but I was talking to Noam Chomsky once, and we both agreed that the propaganda system here in North America is far more sophisticated and far more effective than the crude propaganda of communism was in Eastern Europe. Because they're the adults who the most part knew that it was all nonsense. They didn't say so. I remember because of to say so to a kid would be to risk dire consequences. I remember one teacher of mine when I was in grade three, uh, which would have been, what, 53, maybe 52. It was an all-boys class because we were in gender differentiated schools. And this guy said, um, on, on the winter solstice, he said, uh, boys, this is the darkest day of the year, and it also happens to be Stalin's birthday, but don't tell anybody I said so. <laughs> and it only, it only in retrospect did we realize what a sly courage that took for him to say that. I didn't know what he meant at the time, but I never forgotten it. And only realized, only later did I become, oh my God, this guy was really putting his neck on the line. Had any of us wow. repeated, but, but the point is, so what I'm saying is that the adults knew what was going on. They couldn't say so. Here... People actually think they're living in liberty and freedom and they're free press and they're getting the truth and they don't know anything. The simplest facts are, are elude, um, you know, most people's consciousness. And I have to say again, the same thing is true in the medical world because my knock against um, our profession, my profession, Will's, you know, my profession, uh, is, is not... Um, they keep talking about evidence-based practice. And if there was one phrase I would forbid 
from anybody to say ever again is evidence-based. I would think anybody who says evidence-based, they immediately should lose their medical license because, because we're not basing our, our, our practice on the evidence. We live in a bubble. So every, every profession, as the whole society lives in an ideological bubble, the medical profession lives in an ideological bubble. So that all, all the stuff about interpersonal biology that I told you about, I could go on forever, or interpersonal neurobiology. The evidence is there. Tens of thousands of papers published in major journals. The average physician hasn't got a clue. Now, if I could tell you something. Um, Somebody sent me photographs two days ago. This is a woman I met in London. She's got, I gave a talk there. She's got um, yeah, um, uh, SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, a serious debilitating and potentially fatal autoimmune disease. For some reason, which I could go into, women are much more likely to get it than men. And for some other reason, which you might guess, minority women are even more likely to get it. What a, what a surprise, you know, because it has to do with stress, in my view. Now, the, the average physician hasn't got a clue about that because they haven't looked at the scientific evidence. They just see the disease as an isolated um, uh, uh, event that happens in a body for who knows what reason. Well, if you put it into its context, it has to do with stress and emotional depression and childhood trauma. And the physiological pathways are really clearly laid out. It's not, it's not conjecture. So I met this woman in London. She came to a talk of mine. And all of a sudden she realized, you know, that these questions about what trauma had I endured as a child? What stresses am I under now? How do I relate to myself? How do I feel about myself? How do I behave in the world? These may have something to do with my illness. She sent me photographs two days ago. Two years ago when I met her, her fingers were white. From Raynaud's phenomenon. Raynaud, yeah. Her fingers were white. Her face displayed the typical butterfly rash of SLE. She had this redness of the face over the cheeks. And it looks like a butter. It's called the butterfly rash. It's pathognomic of SLE. Her face is clear and beautiful. Her hands color is perfectly normal. This is without medication. She went to her current emotional issues and her trauma. But none of her physicians had ever asked her about anything that happened to her in childhood. In other words, we have this bubble, this biological bubble that we live in, where we're not putting in people's lives in context. And so that I'm saying that we live in a system that whether politically or, 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 or medically or legalistically, it always ignore context, ignores context. Yeah, you, yeah, it seems like too. Um, I'm really curious about your. How are you framing the conversation of trauma and? whatever you would frame as the opposite of trauma. Well, I don't know what you would frame that as presence or, or like, how are you seeing um, basically the scope of like the human experience through a day? And what is, uh, what is health in a given moment? And what is trauma in a given moment? And is this just a continuum we're all moving in and out of throughout a day, which is like what we're calling trauma is actually some kind of experiential phenomenological experience where we're dissociated, we're not present, and then we move back into presence? Like, what? how are you framing all of that in your head these days? Well, first of all, it is a continuum. And I think that, I mean, my next book is called The Myth of Normal, uh, Illness and Health and an Insane Culture. And uh, normal is a myth in this society. We are all on this spectrum. I mean, you talk about these spectrum disorders, guess what? We're all on it to different degrees, but the different the, the, the differences are more quantitative than qualitative. Um, so yes, we're in a continuum, and uh, certainly, look, if you had spoken to me yesterday, you would have found me. I went to the, yesterday. I went back to the baseline. 
I was really in a dour, embittered mood yesterday. And there was no particular reason for it. It's just where my nervous system goes. You know, not, I'm not there today. So, yeah, I do move in and out of it. Although if I look at my trajectory and compare myself in my 40s, <laughs> believe me, I'm far more healthy now than I was then. Um, and so if you look at the origin of the word health, it has to do with wholeness. And um, so, so, so trauma is the loss of that wholeness. As you say, Keith, the loss of that presence, the loss of that connection. So trauma is not what happens to us. Like, if, if I can show you my hand here, you can see on my uh, forearm here, you see a kind of a wound, right? So what happened is I happened to pass my forearm over the water heater, you know, uh, as I was boiling heat, uh, water for coffee or, or tea the other day, and the steam just blasted my arm and I had this burn. The, tr the trauma wasn't the steam. The trauma is the wound that I sustained. So trauma is not what happens to us, it's what happens inside of us. And essentially, it so happens that the word origin of trauma is wound. It's, it, it, trauma is a Greek word for wound. So trauma is the wounds that we sustain, the psychic wounds we sustain, where if this wound doesn't heal, if, if I touch it right now, it's sensitive, it hurts, you know? If I touch myself here, no pain. Here, yeah, there's a bit of pain there now, even though it's been a weak healing. So trauma are these wounds that haven't healed. And so we're, it, they, they hurt. Or on the other hand, it might be a wound that's scarred over. And what is the nature of a scar? It protects the hurt tissue, but it's also inflexible and rigid, and it doesn't have nerve endings, so it doesn't feel. And so trauma, that's how trauma also shows up, psychically speaking. So trauma is a place where there's an unhealed wound, where it's raw, or on the other hand, where there's a scar that's rigid and unfeeling. And, 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 the, and, and, and a primal trauma is disconnection from ourselves, because it's too painful to be ourselves. So develop all these coping mechanisms not to be ourselves. And then the healing is then becoming whole again, reconnecting, reintegrating. And you both know this from your clinical work, that, that, that trauma is helping people reintegrate, and which means also accepting and knowing these painful parts of ourselves and not rejecting them, and not trying to run away from them, but learning how to be with them. I'm sure that's what your work is all about. Absolutely. It's a, it's a gathering in of these um, fragmented uh, parts of the self um, so that the relationships between them can, can flow. And uh, the dissociation between the fragments of the self don't have to keep uh, repeating themselves in uh, unconscious repetition of trauma. Which actually brings me to this other um, piece we wanted to hear more from you about, which is your self-compassion project. And um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. I'm guessing that it's, it's germane to what we're talking about right now in terms of applying presence to oneself. Mm. Um, so over the years... Um, as a family physician, um, I, I found that, that whether it was physical illness like autoimmune disease or mental health conditions like addictions or depression, anxiety, uh, again, as I've been saying, these weren't random events. They manifested a person's life in a certain context of a multi-generational family, society, and culture, and so on which meant that in addressing these conditions, it wasn't enough to address the biological parameters. So if somebody was depressed, you couldn't simply just say, well, you're lacking serotonin, take some uh, Celexa or Prozac or, or, or Zoloft or Cedrine, whatever, you know? Or, or 
when it came to autoimmune disease, yeah, we might have, we might sometimes very beneficially have to look look after the biology. But if you want to deal with it in the long term, how about looking at the long term emotional factors and stress factors that are discombobulating your system? The problem was that within the medical system, there's nobody I could send people to for counseling because the psychiatrists present company accepted simply for the most part don't know a whole lot about counseling they mostly deal with biological psychiatry and giving them medications that's how they're trained these days and it was disease this disease model and and the medical system in Canada pays for psychiatric visits but I could never find with rare exceptions psychiatrists that knew how to counsel people at the same time, the private counselors, the psychologists, are not paid for by, not paid for by the medical system. So in the part of Vancouver I was working at, people couldn't afford counseling. So I started bumbling my way into counseling. I, I set aside an hour a day when I get one or two people to come in and just talk for half an hour, an hour. So and then over the years I began to develop this method of asking questions what I call compassionate inquiry. That's in retrospect, what I call passion and coherence, the work that we don't like, all these dynamics, they had a reason to come into existence. So if I'm um, depressed, and then I look at the word depression, what does that mean? It means pushing down. So what am I pushing down when I'm depressed? Well, I'm pushing down my anger. But maybe I had a good reason why I'm pushing down my anger. Because in childhood, my parents were too threatened by the anger and I couldn't really express it. So I learned to push it down. That becomes my dynamic. 30 years later, I'm diagnosed with depression. So this compassionate inquiry simply means a professional or relating to oneself, asking questions to find out, well, why? Again, this question of why that we began the conversation with. This phenomenon that you're experiencing, what do, what is the reason for it? Rather than rejecting it and making it bad and calling it a disease, how about looking at the function of it? And how about being compassionate towards yourself for having developed that particular way of coping? So in a nutshell, that's what compassionate inquiry is all about. Now it's evolved into a a psychotherapeutic method that actually I teach in several iterations and different forms, depending on who the student is, who the students are. But it, it arose from my awareness that there's more to us than meets the eye. Or as okay. Eckhart Tolle, the spiritual teacher says, there's more to us that meets the eye, capital I, you know? I, I, there's, there's more to us. <laughs> <laughs> There's more to us than just the uh, conditioned personality and the egoic self. This is a good uh, transition point as we wrap up. We've been asking every ho uh, guest for a while the same question as we end, which is if you had a, a billboard that everybody could see on the planet once in their life, there was a message you wanted to let them know, what would, what would you want each person to know? Um that your authentic self is the biggest gift to yourself and to the world. And to, and to, and to know that, that that authenticity is in you. And if you're not experiencing, it, it's only because at some point in your life, you were punished for being authentic. You were not accepted, but now you can really find your authenticity and, 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 and make a contribution to yourself and to the world. So that billboard would have to do with just be authentic. Be authentic. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Thanks, Gabor. Gabor. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.